If you're like me, you like wearing makeup, but you're not the best at applying it. My routine needed a serious refresh. Luckily, Thrive Cosmetics and their foolproof products make it easy for anyone at any skill level to use, even me. For instance, I use Thrive's brilliant eye brightener as a highlighter or an eyeshadow to make my eye look effortless. There are 16 buildable shades to choose from and play with, so I can use as little or as much as I like. Who I buy from is as important to me as what I buy. And Thrive Cosmetics is the kind of company I'm happy to support. All their products are certified 100% vegan and cruelty-free and have zero parabens, sulfates, or phthalates. Refresh your everyday look with Thrive Cosmetics, beauty that gives back. Right now, you can get an exclusive 10% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash thrive. That's Thrive Cosmetics, C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S dot com slash thrive for 10% off your first order. Auto insurance can all seem the same until it comes time to use it. So don't get stuck paying more for less coverage. Switch to USA Auto Insurance and you could start saving money in no time. Get a quote today. Restrictions apply. It's September 26th, 1810, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. When the King of Sweden pops his clogs, your natural choice of successor might well be his son, or a nephew, or a grandson, or a push, a foreign cousin, but probably not a random French general from a relatively humble background with absolutely no connection to Sweden. This is the story of Jean Bernadotte, whose descendants still sit on the Swedish throne, and who became heir to the crown on this day. Yeah, so Sweden had once been one of Europe's biggest powers, and in the early 19th century it had suffered a century of military defeats that culminated in the loss of Finland to Russia in 1809. And the blame for having lost Finland fell on the King Gustav IV Adolf, and rumours were swirling that Russia and Denmark were planning to carve up Sweden between them, and that gave rise to this coup against Gustav Adolf, and he got imprisoned, and his uncle Karl was then put on the throne, but he was a very old man and He soon suffered a stroke uh, just after his coronation. I know it sounds a bit heartless to be laughing, but I laugh because then he he had no heirs of his own, but he... uh, Oh, hilarious. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) this is where it gets funny-ish, sort of, but but, or at least uh, ironic. But he he was uh, persuaded to adopt this Danish prince, Christian August. And he then promptly had a stroke and died. So that created this succession crisis all over again. Yeah, because the next in line, if you did look to any of the obvious places, would have been the dynasty that they just deposed. There was Mm. no one left in the new dynasty. So they had to look elsewhere. And they looked around to Napoleon doing great things across the continent. Maybe he'd like Sweden. No, it turns out it wasn't that keen. <laughs> um, but he was like, well, I, I do know a fella who might. <laughs> yeah, his adopted stepson, Eugène de Beauharnais. But the Swedish envoys had been sent to Napoleon's court were forced to diplomatically decline. Basically, they found him nice but dim. But they didn't want to offend Napoleon, so they were scouting around looking at other people who were close to Napoleon and who might be interested in the job. And then suddenly, one of the members of the party, a 29-year-old army lieutenant, Baron Karl Otto Mourner, just offered it to Jean Bernadotte, who was one of Napoleon's top generals. He did this without clearing it with anyone. And he was actually imprisoned when he got back to Sweden, briefly, because he had just, you know, it was a very, very febrile situation in Sweden. The choice of the heir to the throne was very important and very sensitive. And it just went in this direction because this random, young, full of himself aristocrat just said, hey, would you like it? It's not like he didn't have any experience at uh, running stuff. Uh, Napoleon liked him so much he'd made him, at this point, had made him Prince of Pontecorvo in Italy and Marshal of the French Empire. So, you know, he he was someone sort of in the ranks, but you wouldn't have put him as a contender to be the next King of Sweden. (laughs) And he also had a very personal connection with Napoleon because he had actually ended up marrying Napoleon's former fiancée, Desiree Clary, whose sister was married to Napoleon's older brother, Joseph. And somehow through this, Napoleon and he had managed to stay friends, even though he'd ended up, like, marrying the woman that Napoleon was planning to marry. Yeah, they they went into frenemy status quite a lot because the whole reason that Bernadotte was able to 
rise through the ranks so rapidly in his early military career was that he was very pro-revolution. And Napoleon was, you know, in the early days, a face of the new revolutionary France. But then when it turned more into the Napoleonic Empire, he suddenly was like, hey, I remember you saying that you were super into the revolution. You're probably not going to be that into imperial Napoleon. So their relationship became a little bit tense at this point. But Bernadotte, I mean, Prince of Pontecorvo sounds very grand until you realise that Pontecorvo is a town. So it was really a bit of a courtesy title. He had some experience being the military governor of some of the um, conquered cities of Germany, which he apparently did very well in. And in one of those, crucially, he had these captured Swedish soldiers who he apparently treated very courteously. And the commander of those soldiers, who went back home and told everyone what a great guy Bernadotte was, was the uncle of Baron Morna, the guy who ended up offering the crown to Bernadotte years later. So, you know, it goes to show. It's all about who you know. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. being nice pays off, guys. He basically (laughs) networked his way through the Napoleonic (laughs) Empire, didn't he? Yeah, and Napoleon had actually offered him the Spanish throne at one point, but he said no, he wasn't interested. For a man who had so many offers of thrones, he had no connection to royalty whatsoever by birth. He was born in southwest France. His father was named Jean. His mother was named Jean. His brother was named Jean. So (laughs) when he was born and named Jean, they ended up adding Baptiste to his name to differentiate him from his brother, who was known as Jean Evangeliste. Um, his father was a lawyer, which sounds good, but when Bernadotte was young, he was apprenticed following his footsteps. But when his father died, it seems like the money just dried up and he had to sort of drop out of that. He joined the army age 17, just as a private, but was able to rise through the ranks through the combination of having the right politics, but also being like very good. I mean, it is astonishing that then along comes Myrna and says, would you like to be the crown prince of Sweden? And he had to think about it apparently for a little bit, which I suppose maybe at a time when anyone with any sort of crown on their head is tending to have their head chopped off well, uh, is not so surprising. Change, Arian, you have to admit. It is, you do. <laughs> and in fact, when he finally did uh, eventually take it up, his <laughs> wife comes along to Sweden and is like, nah, don't really like it, and didn't move to Sweden for another decade. Yeah, <laughs> Apparently, when she saw the weather, she wept. She wasn't a big fan of the climate. She didn't like Swedish people. She surrounded herself with French women. And then she spent a decade in France. And she only returned, it seemed, to Sweden because she was basically under duress. She wasn't keen at all. And actually, Bernadotte never mastered Swedish either. It was their son, Oscar, who was only 11 when he moved to the Swedish court. He quickly picked up the language and he would, for the rest of his father's life, act as his interpreter. I mean, he did at least make a few gestures towards Swedification. What's the word? (laughs) Sweetifying himself. Uh, And he converted to Lutheranism and adopted the name Karl, which I suppose would have been useful in his household in any case, because now he doesn't have to be yet another Jean. (laughs) But he had to also really quickly take over running the country because the king of Sweden by this stage was very old and infirm. But the whole reason for putting him on the throne in the first place to kind of suck up to the French turned out not to be a thing that he was able to deliver on because, as it turned out, he decided to take a position very contrary to Napoleon. Yeah, and specifically what led to the Swedish policy of neutrality, which is still the thing that you you ask most people in the world to tell you about Sweden. And probably within a few answers of ABBA and IKEA and meatballs, they'll get to neutrality, (laughs) right? I mean, that's had an incredible resonance. And a lot of the things that he did sound a lot more liberal than you'd expect. Uh, More midwives, a canal more potatoes, which obviously was a crucial crop at that time to feed the poor. Um, He seeded Guadeloupe in the West Indies and used the money from that to shore up the Swedish financial system. He introduced elementary schools to the country. So all this sort of stuff that contributed to Sweden as we know it now. And it's a really interesting case study because he was elected as king on Mm. his merits. He didn't seize the throne. He didn't inherit the throne, which is the usual ways you get to be king. And look what he actually did manage to create. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, he certainly wasn't intending to rule Sweden as a puppet kingdom of France, which Napoleon realised very quickly. Apparently, in their last meeting before Bernadotte left to take on his new position, Napoleon asked him, you know, in a sort of, we can imagine, a chummy way, to agree that France and Sweden should never make war on one another, to which Bernadotte just said... Well, no, I've got duties to Sweden now. And Napoleon, you're probably frustrated being like, you've never even been to Sweden. You don't know anything about Sweden. We've been (laughs) friends for like 30 years at this point. Apparently, Napoleon said, go and let our destinies be accomplished. 
Well, and what turned out to be their destiny was that Napoleon ended up occupying Swedish Pomerania, which was this territory uh, in what now is northern Germany and Poland, but it was occupied by Napoleon in 1812. And Bernadotte then responded by strengthening his alliance with Russia and leading Swedish troops in the field against the French army. So this really isn't what... Sweden had had in mind about the possibilities that might be opened up by their potential alliance with Napoleon. But crucially, he did capture Norway from the Danes, which was a huge coup, made the Swedish people extremely happy. And that <laughs> yeah, just be- just before, okay, this, I'm just going to take Norway and then I'm neutral. Then neutrality <laughs> forever. <laughs> yeah, and he was a shagger. Well, there's another important thing, isn't it? He gave Sweden a royal family. There's loads of them now. Um, yeah, they selected someone who was fertile, which is important when you have a hereditary monarchy. I mean, he managed to reboot it for them. One of the things that was reported at the turn of the 20th century is that when he died, it turned out that he had a tattoo on his forearm which said death to kings, uh, which was from the days of the French Revolution. And he was a Republican. And during his whole time of being king, he'd never let anyone see his forearm because he was carrying this revolutionary message around with him. You'd have changed that tattoo to death to fins or something to make it kind of (laughs) updated and acceptable. Just scribbling Uh, over it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But apparently on his deathbed, he said, no one has had a career like mine. And I think that's pretty unarguable. Plucked from obscurity, (laughs) taken into the Napoleonic court and then become king of a country that you don't speak the language of and have no particular interest in before you've gone and sat on the throne of is pretty (laughs) astonishing. And also career-wise, you know, he would have been... His father's successor, he would have been a legal clerk or whatever, had his father not just died and then he sort of essentially quit his office job because he needed a change. And from that, (laughs) he ends up as the head of the new dynasty of Sweden. It is extraordinary. It just never happens to me that I quit a job and become king of somewhere. It's really disappointing. (laughs) Tomorrow. The miracle of the age, a lion in your lap, a lover in your arm. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. The difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little word, extra. On the Growth Mindset podcast, I dive into the psychology of human potential and what the science says about self-improvement to give you that little extra. According to experts, your potential is not sitting under a rock waiting for you to finally trip over it. Destiny is merely a function of dedication and hard work. So leave your inner chakra at the door, put the astrology chart down, and stop waiting for something or someone to fix your life. Take responsibility for yourself and give me a listen on the Growth Mindset Psychology of Self-Improvement podcast. (laughs) 